Hi, I'm John Seacrest from the Seattle Angel Conference. We teach new angels how to invest in new companies. And part of our process of experientially exploring angel investing is to help you form your investment thesis. So what are the things that are important for you? Are you a go big, go home kind of guy? Or are you a person who thinks that revenue first is important? Or do you have some kind of impact on the world that you'd like to see all of the companies that you work on uh, engage in? I'd like to introduce Looney Libs. He's the founder of Fledge, a conscious um, accelerator. And he talks about the process by which impact investing might be one of the components of your investment thesis. So Looney, thank okay. you. Thanks, John. Today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about impact investing. I am both a personal impact investor and a professional impact investor. On the professional side, I run a business accelerator called Fledge. It looks and feels just like you know, Techstars and the other tech accelerators that you might be used to, except we focus on mission-driven, for-profit startups. And so here's my background. I am personally an entrepreneur. I've been uh, starting companies for 25 years. And five and a half years ago, I switched from being a tech entrepreneur to being a socially conscious entrepreneur and really helping others start their own companies through Fledge, through teaching at Presidio Graduate School, through writing books uh, and other, other areas. All right, so the talk is gonna take place on this landscape where we're gonna put investing in one corner and philanthropy down in another corner. And by philanthropy, what I'm talking about is really the idea created by Andrew Carnegie or, or made big by Andrew Carnegie about 100 years ago. He decided that he needed to make as much money as possible. And if he lived today and he had his money today in today's dollars, he would dwarf, uh, the, the, he would dwarf the Bezos and the Gates and, and, uh, and whatnot of the world. But he had two, three, four, five times more money than they had. All right, so he did that. And then he came up with this amazing idea that no one else had really done before, which was to then give it all away, right? to create a foundation. Uh, and there were no foundations back then. He had to, he had to invent this idea uh, to take his money, put it in an endowment, and then give it away over time. So make as much money as possible using whatever means possible. And in his case, it was really whatever means. And then create a foundation. And the rules of the foundation today are that it can have an endowment as long as it gives away 5% of that money per year. Right? And its goal is really to earn more than 5% so they can live forever. At least most foundations are like that. All right, so let's take this landscape and we'll put less impact on one end and more impact on the other end. And clearly, in the normal scheme of things, you think about philanthropy as one end, right? I want to make some impact. And what does impact have to do with investing? And, and we'll get there in a minute. The other axis, we're going to take what's return on investment? What is your expected return on investment? So for philanthropy, you don't expect anything, right? You give money away and you expect some goodness to happen, some impact to happen, but you don't expect your money back. Whereas when you do investing, the typical thesis is that you want as much as possible. So if you put your money in the stock market, it's got to beat the average of the stock market. If you're buying bonds, it has to be one of the best, best return bonds as possible, and so forth. Well, we can mix these two together, again, on this uh, magic square. And what's interesting is that impact investing is everything in between. So this is investing where you want to make some impact, uh, and therefore, maybe it's not the maximum ROI, or maybe it's really close. But maybe in impact investing, what you want to do is you know, do things that look like philanthropy, but you want your money back, so you can do it again. Or in my case, in a lot of people's cases, it's somewhere in between, right? I want to make a decent return, maybe not the maximum return, or maybe just the normal return for that asset class. But I want all my money to do good in the world. When I show this landscape, a lot of people say, but wait, 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 it's supposed to be a risk reward landscape. It's not supposed to be a, uh, a impact reward landscape. Uh, and that's true, right? In the normal paradigm, in the normal way that people talk about investing capital, it's really a risk reward spectrum, right? And you get this risk reward spectrum. You can find these things on the internet. And so cash is no risk, not much reward. And early stage private equity is high, high, high risk. And so, so you're supposed to get high rewards. You're supposed to get 10x. Uh, watch the other video on uh, revenue-based financing to say why that's not, in, in fact, true. Uh, and other things are in the middle, right? Properties in the middle and debt is in the middle and so forth. Well, the reality of that idea uh, is not, in fact, that nice, simple spectrum. This is another chart you can find on the internet. This is the actual returns per asset class per year 
for 2000 through 2014, and somebody updates this every year. I don't have the latest one on here. What's fascinating about this is that they're basically random, right? The best asset class to invest in and the best sector to invest in in any given year changes from year to year. Some things start at the bottom and pop to the top and drop back to the bottom. You might as well roll dice, right? So the normal paradigm of risk reward curve is wrong. This is why I personally like the impact reward curve because at least the impact happens. We know it can happen if you invest in the right place. So the general impact investing thesis that I use is that all my money should do good in the world, right? And it should all do good in the world through for-profit companies. It's for-profit companies because they're the only ones that can scale. There's no nonprofit in the world that reaches a billion people, yet Coca-Cola reaches seven billion people profitably, right? In other words, I say that it is possible for a for-profit company to do good in the world, and that therefore as an investor, you can do good and you can make money investing in those companies that are mission-driven for-profit companies. I talk about a little bit about this in my book on revenue-based financing and in some of my other books in the Next Step series and on my blog. You can find me at lunarmobiscuit.com or at fledge.co. Uh, more on this on both those sites. Thanks. Hi, this is John Seacrest again. Take a look at our other work at the seattleangelconference.com. Thank you very much.